Hello, welcome to today's episode of Oxford Saeed's Leadership in Extraordinary Times. I'm Professor Andrew Stephen, the L'Oreal Professor of Marketing and the Associate Dean of Research at the Saeed Business School. Uh, today's episode is going to be about the future of advertising and we've got uh, two industry leaders to, to join us in a conversation about the future of the advertising industry. Um, but before we dive into that, I just wanted to uh, offer up a, a few reminders to, to all of you, our audience. Uh, first of all, you know, welcome again. This is episode 16 for us. Um, and uh, we're, we're glad that you're joining us. If you're a first time um, audience member, then please go to our website uh, at Oxford Answers and, and find all the past episodes that you can review. And we've also released uh, just recently a new podcast series uh, also called Leadership in Extraordinary Times, which is hosted by our Dean Peter Tofano um, with sort of short, shorter summaries and highlights of, of uh, many of our episodes that we've had uh, along the way. So please check that out uh, on your favorite podcast platform. Um, and coming soon, we're also going to launch a series of short summary videos that, that you can use for yourselves and with your colleagues and, and your teams. Uh, with sort of takeaways and practical practical um, advice to come out of these discussions we're having uh, twice every week uh, for the last couple of months. Um, but on to today's episode. So uh, it's about the future of advertising. Uh, and, you know, as we all know, like many industries, uh, advertising during the pandemic uh, has taken a hit. Um, but I think it's fair to say that advertising as an industry and all the practices involved in what, what advertising is, has sort of been in a constant state of disruption uh, for, for a whole host of reasons, pretty much forever. So change and disruption is not new to this industry. So what we thought we'd talk about today is, is not the immediate issues that are happening with respect to COVID-19 in this industry, although I'm sure we'll, we'll touch on a number of those, but actually to think about what the future holds. What are the next sort of waves of disruption uh, and positive change uh, hopefully to, to come into advertising that will affect all of us as consumers, but all of us as well in, in, our, in our jobs in, in, in business practice. Uh, so, so that's the, the idea for today. And, and I would really love to welcome our two guests. Uh, we have Kate Scott Dawkins, who is a Senior Director of Thought Leadership and Innovation at Essence, which is an agency that's part of the Group M group of companies. Uh, Kate, welcome. And also, thank you so much for getting up so early. Kate's in San Francisco, uh, where it is very, very early, just after six o'clock in the morning. So we're, we're absolutely thrilled to, to have you. So thanks for joining us. And uh, our other guest is Steve Hatch, who is the Vice President for Northern Europe at Facebook, who is uh, a little bit closer to, to where I am right now here in the UK. So no, no thanks for getting up early, Steve. Um, well, it's but, great to be here, Andrew. Thanks. But thanks for joining nonetheless. Um, so what I thought we'd start with, as I said, we want to talk about the future and what the future holds. And one of the reasons why, um, you know, I wanted Kate to come and join us today on this topic is that Kate uh, and team at Essence has just, re you know, quite recently released a really, I thought, fascinating report called Advertising in 2030, I thinking 10 years ahead, Expert Predictions on the Future of Advertising. Uh, and so Kate and, and her colleagues talked to industry leaders from some of the world's top agencies, as well as top brands like L'Oreal, uh, the tech giants like Google, Facebook, Twitter, Adobe, uh, and also academic experts uh, like yours truly from, from universities um, to, to sort of get our predictions on a whole host of different scenarios. So it's, it's fascinating reading, but, but what I think we should do to, to kick things off is just to ask you, Kate, to give us just a little bit of an overview of, of what went into this report and, and what you were finding uh, from these experts. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things, as you said, the industry has been in constant flux and, and maybe that's why we haven't always um, taken such an ambitious view of, of 10 years out. Um, we felt there was quite a bit of clarity around the future of technology, maybe how that would look, but less clarity around you know, our industry in particular and what that would look like. Um, and so that's, that's really the, the premise we went into it with. I think after speaking to all of our experts, we were really struck by where there was consensus and, and where there was more of a, a split opinion amongst them. So I would say um, the things that people agreed with on a whole were the future impact of the environment and considerations around environmental impact on purchase decisions. So 71% felt that would be likely by 2030. 
and also the increasing use of bots. So definitely brand side, chat bots and service bots, but also on the consumer side um, with personal digital assistance or AI assistance, uh, about 66% felt that would be likely by 2030. Um, everyone agreed that we we're also unlikely to wind up with a global and uniform approach to privacy and identity. We've seen GDPR and CCPA, but it, most people agreed that that would continue to be regionally split um, or split by country rather than anyone agreeing anytime soon. <laughs> um, we were just, people felt it was just as unlikely for there to be the end of advertising. It's, people agreed it would look different. Um, not everyone agreed on how it would look different, but I think they agreed it would remain not only an important source of revenue for independent publishing and, and journalism, but also a way to access information. Um, so that's you know, likely to, to still be around and important 10 years out. Um, overall, we found panelists were clear there was likely to be only more data and including sensitive data, genetic, medical, biometric, um, and where people were more split was in how that was going to be um, used in terms of making decisions and, and executed against. Some people felt that would continue to be the domain of humans and human workers. And some people felt, um, you know, as in a line of our questioning that that would increasingly be automated. Um, and maybe even some of those jobs similar to customer service or, or retail um, would eventually even be replaced by, by AI and automation. And that was really interesting to us. So, I mean, there's a lot to unpack there and, and I want to come to Steve for, for your reactions in a second, but just what, one observation actually is from what you were saying is it's not all about technology. I think, I think you know, you, you led with um, consumers making decisions based on, you know, environmental factors and sustainability, um, which I guess is not surprising, but it's also important, I guess, for us to realize that, that it's not all about technology, although everything else you talked about was technology. Um, so I guess it's going to be a big chunk of it. Um, but, but Steve, what, what, what's your reaction to this? And also, what, what, you know, I'm, I'm sure from your views as well as Facebook's views and, and from what you're hearing from major advertisers and, and agency groups, what, what do you think the future is going to look like for our industry? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Great, great to be here. Great to see you, and also to, uh, with you as well, Kate. And the, I, I spent a fair bit of time with colleagues waking up at the same time in the morning on the West Coast, so I, <laughs> I, I really appreciate. Um, I mean, I, I first off, I really enjoyed reading um, Kate Essence's report. I thought it was excellent, and there are you know, sixteen individual findings, all of which I found myself you know, absorbed with and and really interested. And and I, 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 today's conversation about looking ten years from now. But to some extent, it is hard to shape that conversation without the context of right now, and, and in particular the, the COVID crisis, because this is clearly a, a, I mean, it's a combination of many things, but what it is for certain is a very rapid accelerator of some of the pre-existing trends um, that we were seeing, both as, as people and citizens, but also working with clients. In fact, my, my colleague, that was a trick or not, but it was a pretty powerful way of starting a meeting, which uh, uh, just recently shared an image. He said, Steve, when was this photo taken? And it was a, it was some time, it was a, it was a, it was people in an office uh, in, I think, in Asia, people wearing masks. And the question that they asked me was, so when was this picture taken? And I thought, well, I, I'm pretty much on top of this. November this year or December and it's a look again look at the computers and the computers in the office did look really quite old-fashioned at that point said Steve this picture was taken 17 years ago and this was at the height of the SARS crisis and the people behind those masks are Jack Ma and the Alibaba team and the at that point Alibaba was not the you know nearly 600 billion capitalized company that it is now it's actually was, was struggling a little bit, but they saw this insight that people are gonna be less likely to be wanting to go out to places to shop. And therefore they can, you know, they kind of really move their organization around. And, and, and in many ways, we're seeing a repeat of that pattern right now. You know, what are the, every business in a short period of time has had to do two things. You know, one, move to a complete remote working business, and whether that's a, you know, very small business or a very large one, and two, Really think about how, in, in many ways, and this is a quote I had from working with an from an agency 
a meeting the other day that they, they found back that actually to be to be digital first is to be consumer first right now. And I think what we're trying to work through is how much how much of the things that we're seeing now are cyclical, or how much are they systemic? Um, and in many ways, it's you know hope for cyclical in some respects, but plan for systemic. Uh, and I think many of the changes that we'll see that we're seeing reflected in in the report from Essence. I think maybe even be more accelerated than the 10-year horizon that, uh, um, that, that, that Kate's captured this in so far. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that was a thought I had too, is sort of the acceleration, I guess, of, you know, digital transformation. And, but, you know, apologies for using that very general term. But, I mean, it, it does feel like a lot of certainly the, the tech-related aspects of not just advertising, but, but how we communicate and engage with consumers um, in, in all types of business, obviously, has had to change really, really quickly here. Um, yeah, Andrew, sorry, just, just ahead, one point that, that, I mean, uh, I know we'll, we'll talk a lot about technology today, but I think certainly what's happened is that every, almost every organization I talk to at the moment, many of them are feeling really energized. I mean, even the most challenged ones are feeling really energized because what they're saying is this is stripping away a lot of bureaucracy, like the decision making as, as rapidly accelerated. So they're, in a way, the technology can exist, but if it doesn't meet the decision-making process in a, in a fast way, then it will perhaps not fulfill the potential. But I think that's definitely happening. Um, right Crisis now. is Crisis often is a awesome. time to, you know, tear everything down and um, break silence and think about if you could disrupt everything, you know, what what would how would you build it new? Yeah, and I, th and I think that's sort of the one of the big leadership lessons I think we're all seeing in yeah in all of our organizations. Though I do wonder, and what I was going to ask you, Kate, is are there particular themes, and maybe let's get into technology here, that, that we think are, are really going to be accelerated by the current situation that we're all in? So it's not that we're waiting five, ten years down the line for sort of mass acceptance, but maybe it's only a year or two away now just because everything's changed uh, in that domain. Is there any, anything you're picking up on um, in your work at the moment to sort of get that sense? Um, I think one of the questions we asked people was whether we would be spending more time in the virtual world than in the real world. And most of our panels, and this was, again, our study was conducted January to mid-February before things had really dominated the news cycles in um, the U.S. And, and Europe, at least, mm -hmm. some Asia, uh, participants from the, the Asian region. But most people thought, you know, no, even 10 years out, that wouldn't be the case. And yet here we all are doing virtual events and <laughs> virtual panels. Um, so I think that's one that's really sped up um, just, you know, that, that we've seen. Yeah, I think I guess the, the adoption of, of, of virtual communication, really. And, and I guess, Steve, from a Facebook standpoint, obviously you've been in the business of, of uh, virtual communication, you know, for a you know, decade and a half or so. But what... How's Facebook reacted to this? That along with, I mean, we see in, in lots of platforms, but the, the, the rise of video conferencing for all sorts of things, not just for you know, work that we're doing now. Um, how rapidly have, have your colleagues been jumping in with new products, new features, getting things out maybe sooner than you would have? What's been going on? Yeah, I mean, actually um, way sooner. And I think there was almost an initial phase for us on this, which was, you know, uh, to, to some extent, and I've got to say a huge thanks to them, actually, whilst almost everyone at Facebook is working virtually and working from home, there is a small number of people who are, who are running the data centers mm -hmm. and the other teams that obviously are there. So actually, there was a kind of a colossal infrastructure challenge um, and that some of the stats are, are, are you know, pretty exciting or sobering, depending on which, you know, depending on what, which, which way you look at it. So, you know, we saw the usage of live has increased by 50%. We saw group video chat in Italy, for example, at the beginning of the lockdown on WhatsApp, increased by a thousand percent. You saw, yeah, so this, so this desire to, to, to come together and this experimentation that we've seen with people, whether that's, you know, ministers running their Sunday service on Facebook Live for the first time ever, and you know, or, or whether that's people in a WhatsApp chat group coming together as a community, probably for the very first time, particularly in urban environments where you may well have just walked past the same house or block of flats a thousand times, but now they're the people that are telling you that the eggs are back in stock or that or picking oh you're picking up their medicine. So you would move very quickly to to maintain and support the services that were initially seeing 
incredible surge of usage. In fact, generally New Year's Eve is peak usage for us. And we were seeing in excess of New Year's Eve every single day. So, um, and then that, in a way that was the initial response. And then it's really been about how rapidly can we introduce new products that help with remote presence. So expanding um, WhatsApp video chat from four to eight, for example, or introducing messenger rooms, which is a 50 person virtual space. And you can be, you don't have to have a Facebook account to do that. And on, uh, on the business side, just last week, we launched uh, shops, which um, I, I, I don't have a right to feel more proud of that than, than others because you know, it's not my work, it's the work of great engineers, but it was, but, but a lot of the London team working remotely have been invo uh, involved in that build. And that's, that now means that every single one of the 140 plus businesses using Facebook can now operate effectively kind of e-commerce or virtual shop on Facebook itself. So that's, in many ways, it's been an extremely rapid process of, um, of innovation and product um, uh, creation in response. And of course, there are many other elements of that as well, uh, you know, managing misinformation, certain, you know, making sure people see incredible and accurate information at the same time, and as well as helping to begin the process of economic support. Because I'd say some of this is right now. Um, I think probably my favorite pivot is the, the is Crookshank's farm. I don't know if anybody's seen this so far, but you can you can hire for five pounds when uh, they're a goat farm. And you can hire uh, for five pounds one for an hour one of their goats to come and join your Zoom video conference, uh, and to add a bit of fun and and excitement. Now, of course, on the, uh, by the way, I did it last week. It was a, it, I, I was so skeptical and it was brilliant, but but you know, but the idea of like if, if the amount of of in a way to like force creativity and entrepreneurship that's being driven by this, and if, you know, the goat farm in Lancashire can think about their assets and how they pivot into a digital. But, you know, and they digitize that in, in a way that drives a different form of revenue, then you can just imagine what's happening amongst kind of millions and millions of businesses, both large and small around the world. Right? And I think the, the theme there is really this sort of notion of, just, yeah, out of the box, creativity, innovation. And, you know, I think, Kate, that, that makes me also think a lot about when we're thinking about, say, the advertising technologies that, that you've been looking at and that you, you work with your clients on, you know, part of this acceleration that we're, we're, we're facing just for, um, because of the situation is going to require that creativity and innovation, which is not, again, not a tech thing, but is, is very core to, to what advertising is about. Um, so let, let's kind of take that a little bit further because I, I wanted to highlight a couple of the sort of themes when we think about the future of advertising, but maybe overlay it with this notion of innovative approaches. Um, and the first one I thought we should talk about is personalization. Um, you know, personalization is not a new thing in advertising, of course. Indeed, you know, platforms like Facebook kind of invented the idea when it comes to digital, but, you know, direct mail way back well and truly before, you know, any of us were around um, was really kind of the beginnings of that. Um, but, you know, this notion of, of we're getting maybe to a point in the, in the near future where sort of every marketing communication can be, can be very, very micro-personalized. Um, you know, that, that, that seemed to be in your report, at least as I read it, to be something that there was fairly a, a lot of agreement on. I guess what's interesting, though, is what, what, what are we using to do that personalization that would be um, different to what we're doing at the moment uh, when we run a campaign, say, on Facebook or Google, YouTube, Instagram, et cetera. Um, so what, what's going to be new about personalization that we're not seeing yet? Yeah. Um, I think for, for me, the first question always is personalization for the sake of, of what. So I think it can always just be um, to make media more efficient, but it has to be for the benefit of the user. Um, and they, they need to, to want it, you know, as much as you can determine that in your relationship with them. Um, now, assuming it's being done in an ethical and, and transparent way, uh, then I think there are some really hugely exciting avenues for personalization. Uh, many of them achieved with maybe even greater levels of, of privacy than we see today um, in terms of, of how that works. So uh, one of the things we're seeing more of is contextual targeting, which you know may sound old, but I think we're doing it using AI to create some really new um, you know, innovations within that. So we recently worked with a publisher on the UK actually to, um, you know, categorize and, and tag all of their 
web pages, say recipes or, or travel destinations, and then actually pull that copy. So whether it was a specific ingredient or a cooking time, you know, 20 minute cooking time into the creative of the ad. So the, the ad copy and creative was incredibly personalized to exactly what you were reading at that moment, but didn't actually require any user data, any personal data. You could do it, you know, without cookies or, or any of the rest of it. Um, and so I think that's hugely interesting, right? And is using AI to enable um, personalization like that, even in areas where, say, you don't have direct user level data. Um, I think, you know, with the advent, again, speaking of, of technology and what it enables, the advent of edge computing, 5G, you know, personal digital assistance, it could be that we're in a place 10 years out where more data remains local on a, on a device and some advertisers are um, more blind to that. The personalization happens locally more to the consumer rather than happening, say, in, a, um, in any ad tech or on the advertiser side, uh, except for those that have earned a relationship with consumers, right, where they've opted in and they've agreed to share data for a value exchange, they get something out of it, they get, you know, more personalized products and services. And so I think that will only, the consumer relationship is only going to continue to get more and more important um, in that sense. So imagine when I finally get to go back to a hair salon, <laughs> it's been a while, um, but, you know, I can share maybe a sample of, you know, medical information or a hair sample. I'm not exactly sure the, the technicalities of, of how that would work. And, they could mix a custom, you know, shampoo product for me on site. Now, if I agree, that could also be shared, uh, you know, with partners or um, CPG brands, and then I can start to get personalized offers for, you know, specially formulated things just for me, right? Um, maybe we, looking at some of the technology in the report, maybe, you know, th that just gets shipped in a, a bottle as a subscription, or maybe I actually go and have it mixed at a chemist or, or a drugstore. Um, but I think, you know, 10 years out, absolutely things we could be seeing and, and really possibly even sooner with some of those technologies. So what, what's your take on, on this, Steve, in, in the sense of, I guess, you know, the effectiveness side of, of personalization? Because, of course, it could be very efficient to reach, you know, the, the quote unquote right people, right place, right time. But is it, do we need to always? Is it always going to be effective in achieving our marketing objectives? Yeah, I, if, if we look back to you know, how we've been talking about and thinking about that at, at Facebook for, for quite a while now, but particularly how that's evolved over the last couple of years. But if I go back quite a while, I think that what's often the, the two words that are missing often in the personalization conversation is personalization at scale. And I think it's often the kind of at scale thing that gets forgotten um, in this, you know, particularly uh, well, it used to be that used to be the right conversation to have with larger organizations because, you know, when you've got hundreds of thousands or millions of customers around the world, you need a degree of scale to the impact that you're looking to create in order to move the dial. So you might, in, in many ways, a, you know, a highly targeted small number of ultra loyal users aren't going to be that helpful in, in often delivering the business growth that most organizations and most organizations um, need. The same is now true of, of, of all sizes of companies. And I think where, particularly over the last couple of years, how this, how this has moved on considerably is where the machine learning has got to a level where the, the, your level of personalization um, is both creating kind of value for people and for businesses at the same time. And in many ways, some of the big value gains that we're seeing on on the use of our platform is is let the machines do the work that the machines are really good at and let people do the work that people are really good at like coming up with fresh creative insights creating you know brilliant compelling work that, that looks imaginative but what we we have this um one of the things we've been focusing in a lot with advertisers is to help them understand what's called the learning phase and in and and whilst people can often think about social media or digital media full stoppers. How do I really narrow down my audience to the tightest possible description of who they might be? Well, that doesn't seem to work very well in delivering business outcomes. But if you give the widest possible audience in the initial phase of any campaign, the, the option to run. So, and then 
let the in, in a way let the machine learning understand who's most likely to respond who's most likely to, in, to to welcome that message and who's most likely to convert on that message that's where the real magic of personalization comes through and and, and often we find that and, and generally speaking like the first 200 conversions and this is on performance marketing rather than brand although the principles are the same they're really not great like they actually look like the performance is really poor so i'm doing that line because the costs look bad but the minute the machine learning really gets to understand what works you see this incredible kind of decline in cost and increase in um in effectiveness so i think personalization is really about enabling machine the way we're thinking about enabling machine learning to make sure that the people that really are going to respond to that message and will welcome that message at the right cost are able to see that and 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 perhaps have a, a a different way of thinking about targeting than than I know I certainly grew up with uh, with thinking about kind of media and channels that that was my job to exactly identify this small cohort of people. Actually, machines are really good at this, and what 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 um, perhaps our best value is in the in the more strategic functions and the creative functions and. You know, as, as, as Kate talked about, creating, understanding the ecosystems around that and, the, and, and understanding the complexity that's there. Yeah, I mean, this, this is a perfect opportunity actually to bring in a, an audience question that I've got popped up here on my iPad. Um, incidentally, we've got people from all over the world right here with us now. For example, Hong Kong, Greece, Brazil, Kenya, Australia, Poland, Mexico, the United States, Romania, Nigeria, Pakistan, Qatar, Romania, Latvia, and so on. Um, so thank you, and, and I apologize if I, if I missed your country, but we know you're out there. Um, but the question actually related to exactly what you're talking about, Steve, in terms of sort of letting, letting the machine learning take over, at least with the targeting. This is a question sort of building on something that you said coming from uh, Rupert, which is, uh, in essence, asking, you know, but what else? So, you know, beyond changing tech, are there implications for either audience definition, which I think we've covered, but channel selection as well? How about in, in sort of that uh, aspect of, I guess, the media planning? Um, are we seeing you know good use of ma uh, machine learning in that too? Yeah, but, well, this might be one for uh, Kate if you wanted to take that for the broader channel selection piece, and I can certainly speak to the um, the Facebook platform. Yeah, I mean, I think where humans and uh, AI machine learning work work best is. To they're interpreting signals, right? Um, so, you know, to your point, taking in data from all sources to try and figure out, you know, where are those areas for, for growth? And that might be on a variety of different channels based on, you know, what advertiser you're working for and, and who your sort of target audience is. Um, I don't know that I can speak to specifics um, for how we're using that exactly today. I think, you know, in the future, those channels might also be more fluid. Hopefully we're seeing, you know, more of uh, CTV, OTT, you know, like digital TV channels and, and linear coming together where that becomes a more fluid process. You know, right now I think it's maybe too fragmented to let a machine learning algorithm, you know, run across things. Um, but, you know, hopefully that becomes more practical in the future, um, certainly. and. Steve, you know, you have more specifics in terms of how that's working within Facebook channels. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a it, it's a great question as well, and it almost feels like the holy grail, doesn't it? You know, mm -hmm. would, would we be able to just you know set goals and set against, set goals against outcomes and price against that appropriately and have exactly the perfect creative in the moment in the right place? And I think in 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 I mean, I'd love to see other examples that might be out, but I think across channel and, and by by probably worth thinking about this more as a cross company more, um, more than a cross channel because because i think the minute you're into the world of cross company you're into some very challenging um um issue, you know potentially challenging issues around uh, uh around data and that's where actually you have to you know we have to all be really really mindful around that around you know privacy being kind of priority number one two and three for companies and 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 and, and people but on the, certainly on, on the way that we've engineered or increasingly engineering our platforms is to set up the uh, um, set up the, the 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 goal that you want to achieve, what outcome you're looking to to drive. So whether that's 
brand awareness or um, or conversion on a website or a mobile and then and enable then uh, the, the effectively the the algorithm the machine learning then distributes the message to what platform is best suited to deliver that at the lowest uh, you know lowest possible return to the lowest possible cost i should say um to the advertiser so you know it could be if you're optimizing your campaign for okay you've got a piece of video you want to show and you want that to, uh, to have a, a kind of 10 second plus view duration that would the the machine would distribute that advertising objective very differently to one where you might be maximizing just straight for conversion so you might see a different spread across audience network instagram Met facebook messenger and facebook itself in main in main feed depending on um what the best outcome for the advertiser um looks like well i should say for the advertiser and people because our, our algorithm takes in into account the um the, the the in a way kind of degree of the quality the relevance of the advertiser it's interesting on the personalization thing i i very rarely get emails maybe this is an a slightly different angle of that, which is personalization at its best is kind of invisible and seamless a bit like a like a really good service experience because i i very rarely get an email from from somebody saying that was an amazing piece of really useful advertising uh, but but i do get emails saying why am i seeing these ads you know that, uh, that have nothing uh, 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 and i remember you know maybe like five years ago it felt like my feed was full of ads telling me I should lose weight and buy stock. I mean, both, both those things may have been true, but you know, it didn't feel like that. But I think over time, um, but by, by to, to Kate's point, making sure you, that we're focused on what's creating value for people. If that drives what we do, then that creates value for business. And if you have the right scale, you're able to match, to marry those two. Well, you know, we don't want to get that right, but that's certainly the goal. Yeah. I think, you know, it's a couple of themes we've, we've talked about now that the, the, platforms and the brands that do that right you know we, we're seeing people i hear anecdotally again now people will say you know my instagram ads are great like that's where i go for product recommendations um but i think increasingly it'll it'll need to feel like part of the experience it'll need to feel yeah. seamless and that'll only be more true as people push into gaming and esports as well um you know subscription television where we're probably likely going to see a lot more product placement and things that feel as part of the content. Um, I think in, in editorial, we're very clear about that needing to be signposted for viewers. This is, you know, this is an advertisement, this is sponsored content. So I think a lot of the, the transparency still needs to be worked out in that sense, but um, certainly it should feel seamless and, and not interruptive uh, for the viewer or user in that sense. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you know, we if we think about where this is headed towards the future, I mean, to to fuel these automated systems, whether it's with with sort of audience targeting uh, or, or or media channel decisions and placement, it's all going to require data, um, and it comes back to what you both said around sort of consumer trust and and, and privacy to to be able to give that sort of data, so uh, we get that level of addressability. But I think the the other interesting thing here to to remember um, and sort of practically, I think for a number of our uh, audience members is, you know, the, these systems basically even, we can get very, very sophisticated machine learning and, you know, in quotes, AI um, for making any of these decisions, but they're, they're optimizing over the sort of a universe of available alternatives. And the more data they have, then the better they can do that, but it's still constrained to the alternative. So, you know, we can't target an ad at someone on, you know, any, any platform, for instance, if, if the person doesn't exist on the platform, you know, it's sort of an obvious point, but, but it's useful to remember, or we can't optimize a media mix, um, you know, using, using data in real time, let's say, or near real time, when some of those media channels aren't in the data set because they haven't been measured in a certain way or they're something a little bit different, like, uh, like we've talked about actually a lot in the last couple of years with influencers, for example, or maybe brand placements in TV and film and, and things that don't normally kind of get put into the typical above the line mix. So, so I actually think where we have to evolve is more comprehensive data, not, not just more data for the sake of it, but if we want to optimize these you know, decisions using automation, then we're going to need to cover more of that, that universe. Uh, and it's actually interesting, I mean, we're, my team and I are working on exactly these sorts of problems actually in the future of marketing initiative with 
Steve's team at Facebook and some colleagues at Kantar and my colleague Jason Bell always refers to it as you're, you're, you're trying to come up with a really complex recipe for a cake and you need to therefore know the full set of, of alternatives that need to go into that cake. And that's really the constraint. We can build great machine learning, but, but we are constrained still. And so I think that's going to be a tension uh, as we move into the future, but you know, we'll, there will always be new things. And I was intrigued, Kate, when you talked about the, the hair salon example and sort of sending a hair sample in and you know, just maybe if you want it before we switch to another topic, but I was interested because that's starting to get into biometric and DNA and those sorts of um, sorts of attributes or variables uh, to describe a consumer. You know, where, where, what's, what's the view on that just, just quickly? Where are we headed with that in terms of more data for, for fueling personalization machines? No, I won't speak to the entire industry. I can, I can tell you what our panelists thought um, and maybe a, a little bit about um, where my own head is at. I think people, at least our, our panelists squarely felt that more of that data would be available, biometric, genetic, medical. Um, again, to not speak you know, blindly about the, the period we're in, that's, that's happening already. So you know, some countries... Um, you know, like China are using medical information, say whether you have a, I think it's a, a green or a red health card determine whether you're able to fly, um, you know, public transport maybe. So um, it'll be interesting to see whether, you know, people's uh, comfort in providing some of that information, medical information um, will continue outside of this crisis, you know, whether there's still willing to, to, to do that, to have other benefits or to be allowed access to other things. I'm, I'm not sure, maybe not immediately. Um, but I think our, our panelists felt that, you know, yes, that, that data, sensitive data even would become more and more available. And it was just going to be about giving the user enough controls and having the right, I think, set of, um, again, relationships and transparency for, for brands to be able to have access to that. I think, um, you did ask about government. I think most of our panelists assumed that government already had a lot of that, <laughs> um, but that the rules would be slightly different um, for advertisers and brands. So I think, um, you know, as long as there's a clear benefit to the user and they, you know, know what they're getting out of it and it's of value to them, I think, you know, again, our, our experts at least were, were fairly sure that would continue to be more of, a, more of an option in terms of personalization going forward. Yeah, I mean, I think we'll, we'll, we'll switch to another topic, but I mean, just noting here, it sort of came in as a question from Mustafa here in the UK, but talking about sort of the need for governance and, and regulation, I think around all of this, I think obviously is going to be the case and, and we'll have to see how that evolves. But I want to move on to I'm another. Sorry, and, 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 and I think that's true, but in, yeah. in many ways, you know, you can't, that, 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 that you can't wait for regulation as well. There is a, how do you, how do you lead on some, aspect, some aspects of this? But I think, you know, in, you know, inherent what Katie is talking about there is, is the question of, of trust and, you know, trust has to come from like the highest level of transparency. Uh, and uh, it's hard to understand value if you don't have the transparency that's there. Um, and that's certainly the journey that we're on. Long way, uh, you know, I think there's, there's generally, there's a long, been a long way for marketing and advertising to go to, and, and particularly the digital side to help people understand how that is used and that they're comfortable with that. So even things like, on Facebook, there's a, why am I seeing this? So you like click on every ad and it tells you why that particular ad is there for you. And I think all of those small incremental steps, I think make a, a you know, begin to help un, uh, unpack what can be a little mysterious and, a, and, and help people have a much more grounded understanding of what's there. So, which is somewhat of a good segue to talk about social media and what the future for social media is. Uh, actually, I'm gonna kick it off with uh, a question that's come in from Shati, who is an MBA student of ours at Oxford. Um, they're saying the algorithm, I guess speaking about Facebook, but we could think of any feed algorithm, uh, seems really narrow in terms of feeds and becoming and becomes more myopic uh, with the current criteria. Uh, can we broaden it if the user wishes to see the rest of the world? And so I guess what really we're getting at there in terms of the question is how to start with perhaps for social media is, you know, it's what we see is, is, is influenced by these algorithms. How do we think there's a future, near future, where 
we will, as users, have more control over what those algorithms do for us. Um, Steve, let's go to you first, <laughs> since you work for Facebook. Yeah, sure. I, I, I mean, the, at the heart of the question is on that, how does, yeah, how does an algorithm work to prioritize the most, you know, the most valuable things? And, you know, I mean, the, 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 this is way, way, way out of date. But I, uh, I do remember just seeing as uh, seeing the increase of complexities on the system as people went from, I think on average, potentially seeing, this is data from years ago, by the way, from, you know, 400 posts, potential posts a day to something like 1500. And that happened over a really rapid period of time. So you have this, so in essence, kind of what's the decision-making process that helps define what the most important things might be. And, um, you know, certainly for us, we, we were finding that we, we reached a point where, it, where, where really it wasn't the, we're talking about feed environments more than others. I think there are definitely other aspects of social media that are fulfilling other roles, but the, the feeders had, had, had lost in a way that sense of being about the core aspect of friends and family and those really, really important connections. And, um, you know, three years ago, I think now, I mean, we had, two of our biggest changes, one, the change in the company of the mission, but also a change in, a very public change actually, in the algorithm to reassert the primacy of friends and family in feed. And actually that, we knew that would come at a cost of time spent and in particular video con uh, um, video consumption. And actually in the, in the short term and the medium term, it did, you know, it did because we reduced the amount of what's called public content. So from businesses or, um, or from, from businesses or, 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 or others that were there. So primarily the purpose was, you know, was reasserting Facebook back to its core role, which is or the core value, which is connecting me with connecting me with family and friends. And that had some, that, had, that was pretty challenging for some organizations as well. And I had, I remember having quite a number of kind of challenging conversations at that time, but it was the right thing to do for, for people to, and, and because, where the decision making within the algorithm is designed to create um, meaningful interactions. And the reason being that the long term latitudinal studies, such as they are around well being and the usage of social media, when things are active, so either you, you know, if you looked at, you shared, you responded, you commented, you've seen something, or uh, um, then actually that looks pretty good. Like people report being less, feeling less lonely, less isolated, more connected. Where it's just a straight passive consumption, then actually the indicators aren't as, aren't as good. So that's why we went through that quite significant um, pivot. Within that, there is this big evolution that we've seen in the use of social media and this balance between, in a way, the public spaces of feed environments and the more personal or group, spa uh, 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 group spaces, such as groups on Facebook, or indeed messaging. And certainly messaging has seen considerable growth around the world uh, over the last few years. So different, different aspects fulfilling different requirements of, uh, in terms of things that we want to do. Yeah, I mean, uh, picking up on that, Kate, what do, you, what, do you, what do you think, if we think about the future of this, is it sort of, we've got our public, versus our private sort of behaviors that we have on social media, maybe messaging, you know, small group type, type uh, things that we're all doing a lot more at the moment, it seems, might be more of our private lives. And then, you know, we'll, we'll sort of portray ourselves publicly on, on other types of platforms or are there, I don't know, what came up in your study in, in terms of thinking about what the future of social is? Is it just that or is there like something else that's on its way? Yeah, I mean, we, we asked quite a provocative version of this question. So we asked whether the majority of social media would be private versus mm -hmm. public, um, because we were looking at that that trend of, you know, WhatsApp or private groups, as, as Steve said. Um, and this was one of the areas where our, our panelists were actually more split. So I think it was 54, 46, or something like that. They were just about even on whether they felt that would be the case by 2030 or not. Um, some certainly felt that the tendency towards private would continue, especially and we've seen, you know, unfortunate um, uh, incidents across social, you know, trolls or um, some of the, the indicators Steve spoke about. 
Um, but quite a few of our panelists felt that, you know, there would always be a desire for um, fame, or publicity, or the, the public square. One of our panelists from Italy called it Piazza. You know, people want the Piazza. They want that opportunity to, to share more publicly. Um, and so I think it's, for us, it was certainly clear that you know, the way social is today and probably even the platforms that are available today would not be the same. Um, in 10 years time, if you look at what was around 10 years ago, looks quite different. Um, you know, TikTok, I think grew to 500 million users at twice the rate of Instagram even. So it's, it's accelerating. And I think that's one of the places, you know, we've talked a lot about AI and machine learning and, and what can you automate versus what you can't. And, and for us, one of the interesting things out of this was that social was going to continue to be a place where a lot of experimentation was was needed and, and probably less of that automation just because it's, it's changing so rapidly and, and all the time. So where does this, I mean, it, it, it's expanding out a little bit, but I just, there's a question I thought was interesting from, from Simon in Kenya, um, who's sort of talking about privacy, but also just in general, how consumer behaviors are changing. Um, and, and you're right. I mean, yeah, if, if we think about Facebook back in 2004, when it first started, it's obviously very, very different to now in 2020. And I think that's true for all the platforms. Um, and in part, it's been driven by, I guess we can call it product innovation, inventing new things. But I think with all of these platforms in social, it's driven a lot by new things that users want to be doing. And, and you know, Kate, you mentioned TikTok as, as sort of the current you know, I don't want to call it a flavor of a month because I don't think it's necessarily going away, but the behaviors that um, users are exhibiting on TikTok and the sorts of things they're doing is, you know, something that's quite new, in part facilitated by the tools that they provide and in part just the creativity of that, that community. Um, so I think it's really hard to predict exactly what these behaviors are going to be. Um, but if we were to kind of, I said it's really hard to predict, but now let's make some predictions. If we are to kind of look at our crystal balls and think about the consumer or user side of this, what, and, and maybe we can learn something from the pandemic now, um, you know, what, what sort of behaviors do we think might be more prominent and therefore, you know, more likely to be expressed uh, in, in, in any type of social platform, be it from a feed environment through to stories to, to, to messaging private type environment? Um, what, what, what do you think, Steve? Yeah, uh, um, I, I, you really made me smile with that question because the, you know, in, in many ways, you know, a lot of the innovation doesn't necessarily come from the platform, but it comes from the people using the platform and finding ways to use it. And then you, and, and I, I, the, 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 the historic example that comes to mind back from 2004 was what was noticed is that people were, at the time, the only photo you could share on Facebook was a photo of your profile. So literally, and what people were doing is they were changing it, their profile photo to what they were doing the night before or what they're about to go and do. Um, so of course you kind of quickly go, oh, people really like to share photos of what they're doing right now on the platform. And you know, I mean, I mean Facebook is certainly not as back then and, and actually maybe arguably out, was not, the most sophisticated photo sharing platform. I mean, Flickr has was far more advanced then, uh, and, and 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 some professional levels, you know, still is true. But the fact that you're able to share that amongst your friends and family that becomes the um, yeah that becomes the most appropriate and 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 desirable. So often, what it is is it looking at behaviours that people are people are doing or, or the way that they've discovered how to use a platform, and then trying to make it easier for them to do that. Um, so I'll give a small kind of commerce example at, at the moment we're seeing you know, we have kind of lots of live live commerce that takes place so people go on Facebook live and they'll kind of talk about their kind of products well we don't we didn't create that we didn't facilitate uh, facilitate that. but if that's a way that we can help say a small business be more successful well what are the tools that we can build for that I mean you know, I remember um, being in a, uh, in a in a trip in uh, in Nigeria in this uh, a telephone market literally this whole place devoted to selling to, uh, techno uh, um, um, technology and talking to one of the small storeholders there he was using Instagram to celebrate the different new products that he had in he was using Facebook to build his community and he was transacting over WhatsApp now we, we don't facilitate that that's just somebody that's just somebody doing it but those those are the indications of 
what do you need to do in order to help people and businesses use their platforms more more effectively and more successfully? If if I was to point to a couple of things that I you know, looking forward, I think we will see live and usage of live in in different formats becoming um, I, 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 something we'll continue to do for quite some time to come. You know, particularly the kind of reinvention of what the, what the live events mean, either that's because of the socially distanced nature of it, but also people going, actually, okay, maybe this isn't as good as being exactly there, but it's pretty good if I can be in this environment with this per this creator that I love, who's the other side of the planet, and now I'm able to make this connection together. So I think we can definitely see that. Um, I think the idea of just remote presence in general so whether that's through video screens like this or other kind of hardware and, and technology, and that's both in a at home and, and, a, and, a, and at home and, and a work from home level, that's that, it's hard to not see how that is going to increase considerably over the and, and be of increasing importance over the over the next few years. And I think perhaps one that we haven't touched on kind of too much specifically going into advertising is we spend a lot of time talking about the technology, maybe not enough time talking about the creative and the content that goes, that goes into that. So I think one thing that was true and, w and will continue to be true is that there will continue to be a premium on people that can create really good, interesting, um, compelling content that helps brands tell their stories. And I think we might be seeing different ways of how that's evolving and shaping over the next couple of years. Hey, do you want to pick up on that? Thinking about the yeah, the I think um, some of the things that we've seen again to your point come up in the the last few months that are really interesting. And one of them is this idea of shared experiences. So Steve started to touch on it, but um, you know, Fortnite concerts or you know, virtual sports. Um, you know, I hear uh, people house party things like this where you can create that shared space amongst your friends. You can't be with them in person. Um, that might continue to be more of the case for at least a while with less people, fewer people traveling long distances. Um, so I think those scenarios where you are experiencing the same thing, whether it's a video game again or a concert or sports at the same time with a smaller group of people, um, and that interaction could continue to be quite prevalent for a while. I think, you know, there's opportunities for for brands to be a part of that i could see you know a, a retailer sponsoring <laughs> something like that you know to to provide the food and snacks um but i think that's certainly one area where we're we're seeing it now and that might continue to be more prevalent is just, you know we have less potentially less linear tv viewing well one of the things that made that great was that everyone was one was experiencing it at the same time you could create smaller versions of that, right? So that at least you and your friends or you and a certain group of people are all watching content at the same time, even if it's on demand. Yeah, and I mean, I, I think, you know, the, the thing that we'll have to keep an eye on, and this does relate to what we're all going through at the moment, is which sort of physical, let's call it physical world versus virtual world, physical world behaviors really come back just as they were versus which ones people are like, oh, actually the, the, the virtual world, the online social media kind of enabled um, version is, is, is either just as good, if not better. And, you know, I think, you know, talking about meaningful interactions that Steve was talking about that, that Facebook has been pushing now for the last couple of years, you know, we know from including our research that that is a good use of social media. It's good for well-being, good for mental health. Um, we've all been forced to use these platforms now for our meaningful social interactions, which is a very clinical term, um, because we have to. So maybe that actually is just more convenient and we like that and we blend that with the physical. Uh, you know, I, on my mind today, looking at the news here in the UK that in a, in a, in a couple of weeks time, uh, the government is saying that non-essential retail can reopen to customers. But then, you know, the BBC was just reporting earlier this morning, sort of all well, the question really, you know, do, do customers actually want to go back to the shops um, versus um, the convenience of, of, of e-commerce as well as, of course, fears of, of uh, infection? So I think there's a lot of open questions at the moment, but I think it lies in thinking about which behaviours have kind of come into, uh, into the fore now in uh, the, the, the virtual space that actually will stick. 
uh, and then thinking about how marketers, advertisers, and, and business more broadly um, can essentially leverage that to generate value for their customers. Um, and and Andrew, just to add a stat yeah. onto that as yeah. well, um, we've been running um, the uh, COVID uh, um, insight seminars every, I think we've just taken it down to fortnightly, but every week, like taking YouGov data and then sharing it in, in, in kind of webinars every Wednesday. And one of the real ones that struck home to me was that, and I think it's probably even higher now, but this is a couple of weeks ago, that 30% of people have bought their groceries online in the last two weeks for the first time ever. Yep. And and so I think, it, you know, you, 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 I think your point is, 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 is incredibly strong. Like how much of this first, how much have we now got past the first go barrier? <laughs> and and that this now becomes an expect an expectation of how we're gonna. Um, and I think that is is a question that every single sector is working out, whether you're in the kind of movie business or you know whether whether you're in FMCG. Yeah, uh, and so I'm just looking at the time, and I'm realizing we're going to be out of time very soon. So I, I thought I'd just allow both of you to have. Uh, a couple of final thoughts, really. Um, this has been quite a sort of a broad conversation. The future of advertising was a deliberately broad topic. Um, but, you know, Kate, perhaps we could start with you. Do you have any sort of two or three final thoughts and maybe, maybe some advice for uh, our practitioner audience uh, who's watching? Yeah. Um, it's hard, again, to pick a couple out of all of this. But I think uh, one is just be really thoughtful and proactive about um, data strategy within your, your corporation or your business and what types of data will be available in the future and, and future proofing for that, um, the kind of transparency required um, and customer relationship that will allow you to have access to that or what you can do with aggregated, you know, non-personal contextual information um, if that's better aligned to the values of your company and your your customers, right? I think that's, that's one. Um, another one and, and where I spend a lot of time just musing is to start to think about the new forms of marketing that are going to be necessary when some of that purchase decision making gets um, maybe moved from the consumer to to bots so when your refrigerator or your you know personal digital assistant is um, making replenishment uh, orders for your household and, and how that completely changes right what does that look like um, for marketing and how does it change the consumer journey, the consumer relationship? Um, and that's something that, that we're looking at um, that I find hugely fascinating. Um, and I don't think it'll be as far away as maybe pe some people think. Thank you. And Steve, final yeah, thoughts. Right. Um, yeah, I just give some maybe practical tips as well. And then, and then some, some also long term. I mean, number one is like, please don't, if your campaign is in the learning phase, please don't touch it. Like let the machines do their work. Don't feel, cause a minute, if you get to like, you know, I mentioned like you need to get to 200 conversions and then it really takes off. If you've got to 199 and then you change something, it goes back to zero again. So like, and, and, and I'm seeing small businesses around the world really adopt this type of technology and approach at an incredibly, a credible rate. Their, their ability to experiment is really fast. Um, the second thing I'd say is like, think about the, Think about the content, think about the creative. And I, I know it might seem a very prosaic thing to say in a conversation about technology 10 years from now, but I'm still amazed at how people aren't making their creative for the context that it's in. So, yeah, how many, so th if you get, thinking particularly kind of mobile first when you're creating compelling work, that's still a muscle that the industry is um is 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 building and it's you know because of the work of people like kate and essence like driving <laughs> like the the, the 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 connection there but it's still i'm, I'm still surprised it, it's it, it, it that, that it's not as commonly adopted even to the extent of if you like just turn things you know don't have them this way have them that way if you if you're making uh if you're making worse so that's that there's clear value to be created for the people and for advertisers there um the the third i would say is and Kate's spoken to it a lot already, but, you know, think about what your messaging strategy is. You know, what is that? What is your CRM approach? What is your loyalty program going to look like um, over the next three years? And now what's the role of automation and messaging and that? And then just finally, I think there's just a big, and this is why it's such a, and thank you for inviting me, such a great thing to be part of, which is this, this is a real moment for, for leadership, you know, and um, in, in the industry. So to be able to, you know, to the, 
gather under and you know under your your umbrella here, Andrew, and to be able to talk about these issues. I don't think it's ever been more important than it is now. And I think you know, and and honestly, if, if anybody hasn't read it, then just put some time aside, grab a coffee and go and read Kate's report because it is really, really stimulating. And I think it's great to be thinking about what's what, not only what's coming, but just how quickly it's coming to us as well. And therefore we've got to really move as fast move how and use all of those insights to move as fast at the, the speed of our customers right thanks all right thank you very very well put and the report incidentally that that we keep on mentioning from from kate and her team at essence is available on their website essenceglobal.com and we'll also put it on our oxford answers website attached to the the summary of this episode uh you know later on uh this week um, but we are unfortunately out of time. We could talk about a lot more things, um, but but we only had the hour. So I want to thank Kate Anna, and and Steve for for joining us. And again, Kate, thanks for getting up so early for us being oh, on the West Coast. Thank you. Um, and I and I hope you both stay well. Um, and I want to thank all of you who who tuned in to uh, to watch us today uh, or are watching it uh, after the live recording. Um, and also now just finally to end on a, on a little uh, advert for our next episode, which is on Thursday this week at, at the same time, two o'clock British summer time. Uh, it's it's going to be hosted by our Dean Peter Tofano um, with panelist Professor Mary Sacco, who's a colleague of, of mine at the at Sci Business School, Professor of Management Studies, and Michael Warren, who is the Managing Director of the Albright Stonebridge Group. They're going to be talking about the business government boundary. So a bit different to advertising, but I think you'll find some similarities there as well. Um, but with that, thank you again for watching. Uh, and wherever you are in the world, please continue to, to stay safe and stay well. And we'll see you again soon.